guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, Mark 14, Lesson 42. Congratulations. You are continuing to study Jesus as a servant. I mean, think about this. In the Gospel of Matthew, we paint this incredible picture of Jesus Christ being the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But now here we are in Mark, it's like a complete flip. Now he's the servant. But what I love is, is everything that he says, in order to be king, you have to be a servant. In fact, just random, Kevin, can you go to Psalm 78, verse 70? It says, he chose David, his servant. And then look what he did. He took him from the sheepfolds. And then where did he go? In verse 71, it says, he brought him from tending ewes, taking care of little animals, to be shepherd over his people, Jacob, over Israel, his inheritance. And in verse 72, and he shepherded his people with a pure heart, and he guided them with skillful hands. Now think about this. Is that not exactly what, what happened to Jesus? Jesus is describing, I've gone from this, I'm a, I'm a person from Nazareth, to now eventually, yes, I will be the King of Kings, but the only way to get to that point is to serve. In fact, Kevin, if you would, you go to Mark 10, verse 45, the kind of the theme verse for really all of the Gospel of Mark. And it just says this. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then the ultimate picture of serving is and to give his life a ransom for many. He gave up Jesus Christ, the servant, the son of man, gave up his life for you and for me. And now I want to paint a picture of how can we, based on the disciples in the scriptures, how did they serve Jesus? So it's kind of like this transition. Did they learn well? Are they learning well? And we, we already know you guys the answer, right? <laughs> for the last three and a half years of, their, of Jesus' life, they're constantly messing up. And I think that's kind of the point. I want to paint a picture of as we attempt to serve Christ, cut yourself some slack because today's story <laughs> should greatly encourage you. All right, so now in Mark 14, here you have the plot to kill Jesus. Like it's getting thick. And as they're getting ready to kill Jesus, do you guys remember we talked about this in Matthew, the anointing that takes place at Bethany. Remember the oil that's dumped all over Jesus' head, all over his feet? And why? Because it eventually led towards the preparation as it says in verses 12 through 16, for Passover. So the oil, the anointing, the preparation for Passover, the disciples are serving and they're going and they're getting things prepared. And then as they're getting things prepared, it says in verse 17, when evening came, he arrived with the 12. And it, what, it's, what you're gonna see in the next four verses is that this is when he is going to talk about the betrayal. One of the original 12 servants is actually going to betray ultimately Jesus by turning him over to the opposition, the opposition of the family, the opposition of the, the, the religious and the opposition of the family, right? Remember that whole sandwich? That one in the middle, Judas is turning them, uh, those people and saying, Jesus, here you go. So this is kind of the backdrop. So then that night they take the Lord's Supper. As they're eating, he takes bread and they talk about the cup. And then in verse 27, here's where I want to go. Kevin, how many predictions did Jesus make? Three. Three predictions in the Gospel of Mark that he was going to die, be buried and come back to life. And in the middle of this, one of the disciples, one of the servants, okay, for this conversation today, decides to, yes, betray Jesus. So we know that there's going to be 11 left. And within that community, uh, there's like this inner, inner circle that Jesus, he knows he can go to at any time. And in verse 27, then Jesus said to them, all of you will run away because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So as soon as Jesus is betrayed, as soon as he's turned over, what, to the enemies, everybody's going to leave. Everybody. So all of these servants that he has modeled really, really well for, he's already predicting, you're going to bail on me. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep are scattered, as he quotes a, a minor prophet. But he says in verse 28, but after I have been resurrected, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Just remember that because in, Matthew, or in Mark 15 and 16, we're going to address this very thing. So Jesus says, the sheep are scattered. And this is like, a, it's already the game plan. Hey, after I'm dead and buried and then I come back to life, I'm already, I, this is where you can meet me. How, how crazy is that? Wait, what? You're going to have to go through all these things and now you're telling me when you come back to life, that's where we're going to meet you? And that's because we're going to scatter? And Peter says in verse 29, wait, wait, wait a minute. If everyone runs away, I won't. Peter says, I am in. I'm, I'm not going to bail on you, Jesus. Are you kidding me? Why would I run from all of this? And in verse 30, he says, I assure you, Jesus said to him, today, today, not like I predict in five weeks, not like in a month, today, this night, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. 
How many times, Kevin, did Jesus predict? Three. Three times, death, burial, and resurrection. How many times is Peter going to deny? Three. You think Peter would have gotten it. In verse 31, it says this, But he kept insisting, If I have to die with you, I will never, never deny you. And they all said the same thing. All of them. We'll never deny you. We'll never leave you. We're with you until the end. Like, this is the great sales pitch. We're in. And now watch this. How do the servants of the ultimate servant serve him? Did you catch that language? Wow. That was a lot there, right? Well, if we can, let's go to verse 32. It says, then they came to a place called Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane, it just says, uh, there's, oh, it's really, actually, the name is only mentioned twice in Scripture, the name. So, Kevin, if you would, would you go to Luke 22, verse 39? So this is kind of a cool picture. In Luke 22, 39, uh, there's two other instances here that we're going to talk about this. But, like, this was his regular place to go. It says, he went out, he made his way as usual to the Mount of Olives, as the disciples followed him. Okay, this is the usual place. As usual, this is where he's going to show up, okay? Uh, we're going to get to a picture here. In fact, this is kind of cool. This is actually, Rich took this picture not too long ago. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Here you have an actual olive tree, okay? Jesus would have gone to this location, okay? We're going to get into some more pictures here in a little bit. In fact, Rich, uh, can you go to the one with the flower picture, the big wide angle one here? And so here's what you're going to see is just, like, this is his, his regular place, and you just picture Jesus just kind of going here. And the disciples all knew this. And in fact, in John 18, verse 1, Kevin, if you'll go there, John 18, verse 1 talks about, again, this is his regular place. It says, after Jesus had said these things, he went out from his, with his disciples across the Kidron Valley. Remember, you have Jerusalem. Uh, just just kind of picture this. This is old city Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Here you have the Kidron Valley, okay? And then here you have the Mount of Olives. And at the base of Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, just to kind of give you a little idea of how close this really, this really is. So like sometimes in my mind when I picture this incredible, beautiful olive tree uh, location, like I just think it's super far. I mean, it's right there. It says, He went out with His disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden. And He and His disciples went into it. In verse 2 of John 18, it says, Judas, who betrayed Him, also knew the place. Judas knew where the disciples were going to be. Why? Because Jesus often met there with his disciples. This was his regular coffee hangout, except this is where he went and prayed. Judas, because he was one of the original 12, one of the original servants, he knew that they were going to be here. Okay, so that is your backdrop of where we're at now. Gethsemane, okay, it actually means, Rich, can you go to that close-up picture of of the tree. Gethsemane means oil press. It's a garden filled with an olive tree on the slope of the Mount of Olives. And so here you have olive press. Does anybody, you guys ever, can you guys describe how olive press works? You guys have any idea? Olives, Kevin? Squish the olives. You just squish the olives. You press the olives together. That's it. <laughs> Genius, Kevin. Oil comes out. Wow. And you have olive oil. Aren't you glad you guys signed up? <laughs> Uh, Rodney Cooper just said this. Now, you know, down the road, you're going to see this. And I think this is a, just a simple picture. But eventually Jesus would now be pressed hard himself concerning the fulfillment of his mission as a sacrifice for sins. Here you have this olive press. I mean, this, it is going to come down in order to see oil, right? Eventually Jesus is going to, we're going to talk through the struggle that, that Jesus actually has. And so it says this in verse 33. It says, he took his friends with him, Peter, James and John with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and horrified. I mean, let's face this. The humanity of Christ, he needed moral support. These guys know Jesus. They know what he's been predicting. They know what he's being talked about. And it says, he began to be deeply distressed and, and horrified. Okay, this word horrified. John MacArthur says, it's like this terrified amazement. Okay? In the face of bearing God's fury against sin. I mean, Jesus clearly knows what he's going to go up against. It says that he is sorrowful, right? In verse uh, 33. No, that's right, Kevin. You're fine. 
He is deeply distressed and, and, and uh, horrified. It's also, you can also say he is sorrowful in Ma Matthew 26, 38. Why? Because this, just picture this, the full cup of a divine fury against sin uh, would eventually become his drink. He was actually going to partake and drink of everything. He's not afraid of man. I don't think he's distressed because afraid of man. I don't think he's distressed because of the physical torments, as MacArthur says, of the cross. I think he is literally distraught because he's about to bear the sin of the world. It's a, a silly illustration. But like, if you guys ever done something and you know it was sin and it just bothered you and it like the conscience, you just, you couldn't shake it. Is anybody, you know what I'm talking about? Like you have to do something about it to cleanse your conscience. So you got to ask for forgiveness. You got to come before the Lord. Like, and it's just a, a weight. Can you imagine all of the sin falling on one person. I think that's the image that in my mind, like he's so deeply distressed, he's so horrified, like it's all coming on emotionally, psychologically, spiritual suffering. And if you would, Kevin, 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is what's going to happen to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. Jesus is going to bear the sin of of the world and he didn't even know sin. One more illustration, uh, uh, Galatians 3.13, we've talked about this before. Galatians 3.13, what does he do? He redeemed us by becoming, he, he, from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. He took on the weight of the curse of the law. So the weight of the sin of the world and the weight of the curse of the law, and he's going to take it. I don't think it has anything to do with the piercings. I don't think it has anything to do with fear of man. I think he is just thinking in his mind, I'm going to take on the sin of the world. And so he says in verse 34, and he says to Peter, James, and John, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. This uh, MacArthur says this, sorrow to severe threaten. Like at some point, I want to just make sure I get this right. It is actually possible for a person to die from sheer anguish. Physically, it's possible. Um, what do you think that actually leads to? Like physically, how would we see it manifest? Like in my mind, when I think of stress, I think of anxiety, I think of heart attacks. Strokes. I'm not saying that's the case for Jesus. I'm just, I'm trying to give us a picture of like if you carry and create something like if you get to that point physically or mentally or emotionally, like scripture says, my soul is swallowed up to the sorrow to the point of death. Like it could happen. That's how deep Jesus was in anguish. Kevin, can you go to Luke 22 verse 44? Like it, he had to carry it so much. It was so real in his mind. Like look what happened here. And there's whole kinds of arguments about this verse right here. Luke 22, 44, being in anguish, he prayed more fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. I think it's just, it's again showing his humanity. I mean, he knows what's coming, but the humanity side, he's, he knows it's coming. He knows it's coming. So much so that he is, and it says, like drops of blood. So people are like, it wasn't blood. Was it blood? All I want to know, all I, all I know is like it, 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 something was not right. Something was not good. Like, I mean, just because it's, he's taking on everything, past, present, and future. The sin of the world, the weight of the world is coming on him. And all he asked was his friends, stay awake. Servants, friends of mine, do you guys remember? Can we, can we go back to verse 31? Can we go back to verse 31? What was, what was their conversation, right? Do you remember this whole thing? He says to Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the crow, uh, rooster crows twice. And then he says, no, 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 no. I will never deny you. And then everybody, all the disciples, they jump in and say, we're not going to deny you either. We're not going to scatter. We're, we're in. And all Jesus asks, Peter, James, and John, he doesn't even say, get a sword. He doesn't pull out your Bible. His one word, two words to his friends were stay awake. I just need to know you're with me. 
I am in anguish. This isn't looking good. I just need some friends. They're like, are you with me? Can you imagine this, this picture right here in the garden? Guys, just stay awake. And scripture just continues on in verse 35. He went a little farther and he fell to the ground. It says he began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Is Jesus, just, just when you first read this by glance, you kind of just think, is he asking that he doesn't have to die? Like, is he asking that he doesn't have to be crucified? Like, is he asking to, like, not have to go through this? Like, I, that's, that's what it looks like from first glance. I like this, what John MacArthur said. Jesus wasn't asking God if he had the power to let the cup pass, but if it were possible in God's plan. That makes sense? Explain that a little bit, Rich, will you? Well, I'm just thinking he, he is, he's just asking, hey, um, if, there's, if there's another way to do this so that I don't have to bear the sin yeah. of it, I'm, I'm open to that at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm still willing to go through this. I'm Should still, this be your plan? Yes, I'm still willing to do this, but is there another way to do this? Right? Yeah. He's not questioning uh, who he is or, you know, kind of what that looks like. And so here in verse 35, look what it says. The hour might pass from him. So he began to pray that if it were possible, the hour. What, what is the hour? Okay. Usually it's in reference, as MacArthur says, the time of sacrificial death as decreed by God. Okay. Letting this actually go away. Then there's another thing here. Okay. The other one is, is that it included, this hour included everything from not just death, but the betrayal to uh, Jew Jesus' trials to the mockery and to the crucifixion. So like that hour doesn't just mean on the cross. That hour actually means mockery, betrayal, crucifixion, the whole process. Funny enough, that, that little phrase hour, that the hour might pass, it's used constantly in the gospels. Can you go to John 2 verse four, Kevin? John 2 verse four, remember, he began to pray that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. What is it has what has this concern of yours to do with me woman Jesus asked my hour has not yet come All throughout scripture Jesus talks about the hour This is what he's talking about John 7 verse 30 So he says at that point my hour has not yet come and John 7 verse 30 this is what the scripture says Then they tried to seize him yet no one laid a hand on him why because the timing wasn't right his hour had not yet come over and over remember shh, don't tell anybody why my hour hasn't come yet over and over again my hour hasn't come and so now what is now what is he saying kevin if you go back go back to verse 35 he began to pray that the hour might pass from him <laughs> he's all saying hey look the hour hasn't yet come and now he's saying as it's here can you just let it pass and do it a different way Hebrews 5, verse 7. This is a neat little gem here. During his earthly, earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Okay, this is the picture of what's happening. Verse 8. Though he was God's son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And then in verse 9, it says, After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Go back to verse 7, if you would, Kevin. He offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him. Did you see this? Who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his, of his reference. Yes, you know what this means? It means God did answer his prayers. He was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. And this is what he said in verse 36 of Mark 14. And he said, Abba, Father, he says, Daddy, Papa, like they don't, the Jewish people didn't talk like this because this was a personal terms. Daddy, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus' prayer is pretty matter of fact. He's not, uh, he's not willing to run from it, but he sure doesn't want to do it. He's willing to embrace it, but he doesn't have to, what, like it. He's carrying on the weight 
of the sin of the world. Like, I have to keep reiterating that. One sin bothers the heck out of me. I can't imagine past, present, and future sin falling on one person. He doesn't want to do it, but he says, not what I will, but what you will. <laughs> I love this intimate Aramaic term. And he says, Daddy, Papa, I, I'm, I'm here. And so as he's crying out, in verse 37, it says this, then he came. This is the first time he's praying in the garden. First time. There's going to be three of them. He came and he, he found his buddies. <laughs> found them sleeping and he said, Simon, notice he doesn't call him Peter. Peter would be the rock, same guy. But he's calling him Simon. It's like he's going back to his old way. Simon, are you, are you sleeping? He asked Peter, couldn't you stay awake? I gave you two words, stay awake. Couldn't you just stay awake for one hour? Poor Peter, the guy who said, I'll never deny you, I'll never leave you. The servant who has learned from the ultimate servant, he couldn't even serve Jesus this way and pray. Did you notice Peter is never given a response? Doesn't say anything. In verse 38, it just says this. Jesus says, stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> you know how hard it is to stay awake in prayer time sometimes? It doesn't mean we don't have a desire to stay awake. It just means we're a human. Flesh. <laughs> is, it, is, is, when he talks to Peter there in 38, is that him? Is he talking about himself? The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. G Jesus is saying this. Yeah, absolutely. And any time you can help intercede on my behalf to help me fight this, praise the Lord. I mean, that, that's what he's, he's wanting. He's wanting this. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty real. And he says, stay awake. I need you to keep alert. As one commentator says, I need you to discern what we're facing. I need you to understand that the ramifications about what's to take place. And yet what happens in prayer, and I think this is a really key, key point by one commentator, don't let your self-confidence put yourself to sleep spiritually. Okay, you understand that? Like when we are so confident that we don't turn to the Lord in prayer, it's because we think we can do it. And then may, maybe Peter is like, it's fine. Remember, remember what he said at the end? He said, I got it. I'll never deny you. I'll never leave you. And what happens? His flesh is weak. His flesh is weak, but his spirit is willing. That's the first time of the prayer. Now, the second time in verse 39, right? What does it say? First, uh, in, ver in verse 39, second prayer time. Once again, Jesus went away and he, he prayed. He went back to the Garden of Gethsemane saying the same thing. What do you mean? That, what do you think that means saying the same thing, Kevin? He's still, still asking God, is there another way? Take this cup. Not my will, but okay, fine, but your will. So he, he's saying the same exact prayer. Praise the Lord. And he came again and he looks for his buddies, Peter, James, and John. And he found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. Their eyelids were heavy and you could not, he could not keep their eyes open. They didn't, they didn't even know what to say. They had no excuse. Peter, who always has something to say, had no response. Two times they're praying. And then finally to wrap this thing up, the third time in verse 41, it says, then he came a third time and said to them, remember? So that means he went away, he prayed. He probably prayed the same thing. He comes back and he says, are you still sleeping and resting? <laughs> are you getting enough rest? Can I help you out at all? Enough. The time has come. Look, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Notice now this is no longer a prediction. He's now saying, it's happening. And so this is what he says in verse 42. Get up. Let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Judas, one of the original 12, one of the original servants, right, suddenly arrived right here. And with him, with him was a mob with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And I'm just going to leave it right there. 
Because the point that I want to go to today is, is the way that we can serve in the kingdom of God. Things that we need to learn from our servants as servants of the Most High, of the living God, of the King of Kings. We need to learn how to pray and be on watch. Three, three times. It's interesting enough. I think this is, as one guy says, this was a formula for the Roman audience, the Roman believers, the Gentile audience that the Gospel of Mark is being written to. Why? Because if you've seen at all the Apostle Paul movie, right? <laughs> These Roman believers, they have to be prayed up amidst ongoing persecution. And Jesus is saying, please, I need you to be awake. Go to Colossians 4, verse 2, Kevin. This is how I want us to close. I want us to understand you and I must, the way that we can serve the living King is persevere in prayer. Colossians 4, 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it. Stay alert in prayer. How do you do that? With thanksgiving. So if you're like, I can't stay awake, continue to give thanks to the Lord for He's given you this, A, B, C, and D. Just keep going through thanksgiving. That'll allow you to stay alert. Can you go to verse 3, Kevin? Colossians 4, verse 3, and it says, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison. In verse 4, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. All of this has a mentality and a heart of perseverance with prayer. Luke 11, verse 8, same mentality. Do not give up. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he's a friend. Remember, he's knocking on the door. Remember this parable of friends knocking on the door and the guy doesn't want to go to it? Yet because of his persistence, the guy will get up and give him as much as he needs. Perseverance in prayer allows us to be awake and alert at all times. And you guys know Luke 18, verse 4 through 5. Luke 18, through uh, 4 through 5, here it says, For a while he was unwilling. Remember the judge? But later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect man, watch in verse 5, Yet because this widow kept pestering me, I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Can you imagine if in the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm not saying it would have changed any of the results. I'm just saying Jesus is asking you and me, stay awake. Our role, our job is to persevere. The way you can serve the living King is to be persevering in the power of prayer. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without what? Ceasing. Do not stop in your prayer life. And so what does, this, what does this look like? In Romans 13, verse 11, Kevin, if you would, Romans 13, verse 11. Besides this, knowing the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Look, if you and I believe that we are, as we talked about yesterday, as we were talking about today, we are in the early stages, the beginning stages of the end times, then you have to be awake, you have to be alert, and you have to know our salvation is nearer than, than ever before. Church, wake up. Jesus is just saying two simple words, stay awake. <laughs> How can you get ready for the end times? Stay awake. All right, guys, Mark 14, Lesson 42. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.